Hello, Revere, and welcome to our Revere Veterans and Community Show. And I mean community because we have a great community veteran. Her name is Olivia Amferranti. I like to say she's the Revere's Woman of the Year because she was given the award in 2018 of Who's Who. First of all, Olivia, before we start, let me wish you a happy birthday for later birthdays. Thank you. Happy Thank you birthday to you. Okay. She is, like I said, Revere's Woman of the Year and I believe America's Woman of the Year also. Now, she was given the Who's Who Award, where only nine people were given it out of 350 million Americans. The other eight were spread all over the country. So, Olivia, start off by telling us exactly how you got involved in this. Okay, in, um, in around 1988, I got a letter from Marquis Who's Who, and somebody recommended me. You can't recommend yourself. Someone has to recommend you. I never could find out who it was. So they, they said, if you want your biography in um, Who's Who in American Women, so of course that was great. So my mother and I decided, yes, we'd buy a coffee. Didn't have to buy one, but naturally we wanted to. So then over the years, I, they kept sending me letters, add to your biography, and it's going to be in this who's who and that. But I didn't buy any of them. It didn't cost me a penny. I just sent back the forms every, every so many years. And then I was very, very surprised in 2017 when they sent, sent me a certificate, and they said I got the Lifetime Achievement Award. So I, I didn't really think too much about it. I didn't really understand it. And then a, a nice lady called from them and she explained it to me and she said we're making a uh, who's who in, in 2018 who's who in America and we're going to do something we never did before we're going to put on the front of the book um, p each page for each person one page for each person with their picture and their biography and then the rest of the book will be the normal who's who so, of course, I was thrilled. I didn't know how they picked me. I guess maybe because I'd been in there almost 30 years. That's all I could think of. But she seemed very impressed with the fact that I was a teacher of the blind, but the thing that seemed to impress her was that I am visually impaired myself. So that they were very interested in that. So I said, okay. So I, I decided I, uh, I got the book. A couple of weeks ago, 2018, they sent me two. It's huge. And they sent me two, and I only paid for one, so I brought one to the Revere Public Library, because what was I going to do with two? <laughs> and then along with that, they kept sending me things like plaques, like the one that said uh, Life Achievement Award. And then um, a few months ago, they said, we want to put uh, nine people that got that award, if, if you want, you know, naturally I had to pay for all these things, but I didn't mind. We want to put it in the Wall Street Journal. So they sent me 10 copies of it, which of course was in black and white, and then they sent me the color one. So that was thrilling. I never expected to get that. Right, Olivia, I see a plaque of the Wall Street Journal to your left. Right. Over there. Yep. And you are the third one from the top. That's right. Out of nine people. So if they can just, there is this the picture right up there on the TV showing you right there. Out of nine people, that's quite an achievement when you have 320 million Americans yeah. and they're only picking nine. And the Wall Street Journal is not uh, just a fly-by-night newspaper. No. It so goes nationwide. I guess the Maki Who's Who took an ad out in the Wall Street Journal. And by the way, they're the oldest biography company, 1899. There's a lot of others that claim they're who's who, right. but they're lying. There's, there's probably a hundred others that have similar names, and some of them have tried to call me to get me to buy things, and I know they're all fakes, so I don't. And, and there's only one lady that talks to me from who's who, and she said, if anybody else ever calls you, they are not from us. Right. Do you get a lot of scam calls for the who's who thing? I've got a couple, but the, when they wanted me to buy an ad in some magazine, and then I said, well, are you Marky Who's Who? And they said, no, and so I didn't. But I have a special number from, uh, the, uh, you know, so many digits. That's my personal number. So the woman told me they're never going to know what that number is, so you'll never get stuck. 
So I've never got stuck giving anybody any money, just just marking who, so that's voluntarily. I didn't have to get these plaques, but I guess my vanity sort of <laughs> took over. And I said, well, I might as well. I didn't ask for this award. They gave it to me. I had nothing to do with it at all. But I have to tell you this, Olivia. I was going through the newspapers, and I happened to find the Wall Street Journal. It was laying around, so I'm looking at it, and I'm looking at it. And I'm looking through the picture of who's who, and I see the name Olivia Ferranti. And I says, that can't be the same Olivia Ferranti from Revere, Massachusetts. So I looked it up, so I got on the phone and I called you. And I says, yes. you know, uh, were you, uh, you and the, I believe it was the December 26th. Yes, that's right. Was it December 26th? Yes. Yep. Journal, and you said, yeah. I says, my God, it would be an honor to have you come on TV and let the American people, and especially Revere, see you. So I want to say thank you. Well, thank you for asking. You know, I've been on your show a couple of times before, and I've always enjoyed it. I know, but never as Woman of the Year. <laughs> well, that's you. You'll have <laughs> to me blushing. To me, you're the Woman of the Year. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so that's great. Before we get involved, could you tell us a little about your education growing up as a child? Because, you know, how, uh, there's a lot of questions I want to ask you, but let's start with that one. Okay, well... Um, when I was little, they didn't have kindergarten in Revere, but they thought I should go to kindergarten. So um, I went to Chelsea. I went to the Williams School for kindergarten, and they had me, they had some large letters and things that, you know, they would show me at the, what they called the sight-saving class. Then I would go to the kindergarten. But I already knew how to read, because my mother taught me how to read before I went to school. Oh, that's the, great. Then I went to three years in Malden and three years in Medford, they had what they called a resource room. I went to a regular class all day, and then for one hour, I'd go into the resource room with the teacher. It was one-on-one, -on -one, and I would learn things like Braille and typing and, you know, stuff like that, that I, and get large print books and Braille books, things like that. And then when that finished, I went to um, McKinley School and then Garfield and then the high school, and then I went to... Um, Regis College for my BA and uh, Boston College for my Master of Education. That was to teach the blind children. And then later on, I went, after I got that, I went, after a few years, I went and got more credits at Boston College and Lesley College. Now it's called Lesley University. <laughs> it's near Harvard. Very, very nice place. Right. Now, Olivia, you are a teacher of the blind, but I've got to ask you a question. As an ignorant layman, how do you teach a blind person? I mean, how do you do it? Well, the, the main thing of uh, teaching a blind person, you want them to be literate. So you don't want them just to listen to tapes. Oh, so see. you teach Braille. Braille is an alphabet that's made out of dots. They're little bumps. They're called dots, but they're little, little bumps. bumps that Louis Braille invented. And when a blind person learns Braille, they not only can read by themselves, they can uh, write uh, with a brailler that's like a typewriter, except it does the little bumps instead of uh, ink. So they can write letters, they can have an address book, they can, you know, write uh, anything. Anything that a sighted person can do, they can do. But a lot of the teachers don't like to teach Braille. I used to have a fight every time we had a teacher's meeting about the teachers of the blind because they were all sighted and they didn't learn Braille with their fingers like I did in the first grade. They learned it with their eyes and they thought it was so hard. I said, yeah, but it isn't hard for the kids because they learn it with their fingers. Braille was invented for the fingers. And I said, you have to teach them or they'll be illiterate. I don't care how many computers and tapes they have, if they can't spell and they can't make an English sentence with grammar, how can they be literate? And that was that I, they didn't like me very much for that. <laughs> no, and I'll blame you. Now, I got a question. The computers, you have to see what you're doing, the letters. Do they have computers for people that are blind? I mean, they may not see well, the picture. Well, they, they have, you can put additions onto computers for either large print or audio or Braille. Braille. Oh, you can't can put up. Braille on the computer? You, you, you can, it, it, you have a printer if you want to type in something. See, also besides teaching Braille, another skill 
that we always teach is touch typing because handwriting is really hard for a blind person. Right. So if they, I learned typing in the third grade. I used to do all my English homework typing instead of, I could print, but I, I did, so that's, they learn, they can input on a computer and they have machines that can, if you want to braille something, you, you can put it in the computer and it comes out in braille. So they, they do have that. They have, like I said, large print on the screen or else you can have the computer read to you, you know, audio. Right. Now let me ask you this. If people who have children that are impaired seeing things or seeing, how would they contact, if they wanted to get help, who would they contact? Well, it, it, if, you, if the person went to public school, they would contact the special education department. And then they would, the people there would arrange for them to have a teacher, make out an educational plan, and anything that they needed to help them, like le learning how to get around the school, um, you know, de de depending on the skill of the person, the intelligence, the, if they have any other handicaps. So it's a very specialized field. But you said you went to the one at Chelsea where they had it. Well, I just went there in kindergarten. Oh. They had what they called the sight-saving class. It wasn't for blind kids. It was for people that couldn't see too well. But what was bad about it was, for me, it didn't matter. I only went a few minutes a day. People that got in that class were stuck there for their whole career until they got out of high school. They never with the other kids. I was not in that position. I was with all the kids, and I only went to the resource room for one hour a day. So I was not segregated from the, you know, the other children. They, when I went to school, they were just starting to have the blind people go to public school because there were so many of us that um, Perkins couldn't handle at the residential school. Because when I was born, I was premature, and that's why I had the sight problem. I was born perfectly okay, but I got it from the incubator, the oxygen. Oh. The year I was born in Massachusetts alone, there were 2,500 of us. With that problem? With that problem. Wow. So they couldn't, Perkins certainly couldn't handle everybody, so they had to do something. So they would train these teachers and have them teach in the public school. Right. I want to get back now from Chelsea. We're going to travel back to Revere. Tell us some of your achievements in the city of Revere. Okay. Well, um, one thing, I, when I became a lector in the church, I had to walk up to the sanctuary, a up a couple of stairs, and then go down. Going up, I could do it. But going down, there was no railing, and it was those wooden steps with no markings, and they were rounded, so I couldn't see to go down. So I talked to the pastor, and I paid to put railings so that people could hold on to the railings to go up and down the stairs. So, um, and then after my father passed away, I had to do a lot of walking on my hill in the 80s. So I noticed that the street lights were not that bright. So I called my ward counselor. I never called them before or since, Mr. Jordan. Wait, this is way back in 1988, maybe. And I explained it to him, and he said, well, I'll put a I'll talk to the council, and we'll see if we can get the electric company to put the sodium lights. He said, do you want it in front of your house? I said, no, I want from my house down to the bottom of the hill because it won't help me if it's only in front of my house. And that was the last street that the electric company did because they, they didn't want to, it was expensive for them. So I, I felt real, and the people in the neighborhood would complain, the old ladies, and I'd say, well, why don't we all go to City Hall? Oh, no, you do it, like uh, when the, the lights didn't work or something. So I, I kept going to the mayor's office. This is when Mayor Hass was in. I'd never gone to the mayor's office in my life, but I, um, I belonged to the Commission on Disability then, so I kept bothering him about the pedestrian lights, that it was always green and you couldn't change them. And, you know, they didn't really listen until one day the mayor was on crutches and Steve Rich and I were doing some, some PSA on, on Broadway and the mayor had to cross the street with us and he said, oh my goodness, he said, this is a death trap. They're not even slowing down. It was awfully funny that after that happened, 
they suddenly decided they were going to fix the light so that you could press a button and the light would turn red and there would be a buzzer. Right. So, and my, my last one was um, blind friends would tell me that they wanted to go to the cinema, uh, showcase cinema, but there was no um, closed captioning or DVS, which is the descriptive video for the blind. So I wrote a letter to the company and I talked about how many blind people were, I got the statistic, how many there were in Revere and how they would they come with their families and other you know, surrounding towns. And it was just lucky. I didn't know when I wrote the letter. They were thinking of installing it somewhere in Massachusetts. Within two weeks I got an answer from the vice president and she said they were going to do it. So that's why um, the Showcase Cinema got the DVS and the closed captioning. That's great. I have to tell you something. You just mentioned something good about the lights. You had a call for the lights, but now something happened to Revere that's great. They have what they call a 311 number. And if you need lights on your street and they're out, you can call 311. There's a gentleman there by the name of Alan Fitzmaurice and Ruben Cantor, two great people that are part of the 311 thing in the Revere. They will help you. So anyone out there who has a problem with lights that need it in front of their house to protect themselves because you can fall and get hurt, just call 311 and I'm sure they'll help you out in every way. But they didn't have that one. You were young. No, but, but you, can, you can also, if, if your light in front of your house goes out, you, at night, you call the electric company and tell them. Right, but I did call the electric company, but sometimes it takes a long time before they do it, but I'm sure... I wouldn't be surprised. It did. I could vouch for that. But uh, my counselor, Ira Navaselsky, did a great job in getting the lights turned on in our street. They were out for a while, so he did a great job. So thank you out there, Ira. But I want to talk about another woman of the year. Maybe... A lot of people don't know her. Her name is Lois Diamond. She used to be at our senior center. Yes. Did a great thing, not only for the seniors, but for the veterans, Lois. And I believe someone should nominate you as Woman of the Year, but you could tell us a little about Lois. Lois is a very nice lady. She, she, uh, went, she studied, she went to college to, to, to you know, learn about the elderly. That's what she specialized in. So when she got the job there at the senior center, she was really qualified. She took up gerontology. That's the study of the elderly. And she's a very lovely person. She's very interested in people, um, very sympathetic to people's troubles. And I'm sure that uh, she had to leave. She had to retire because of health reasons. But I'm sure that the seniors really miss her because I know she used to go above and beyond to help the seniors. She would know who might forget to reserve their meal for the next day, or who might forget to call up the shuttle, and she would call them and ask them and, and uh, you know, make sure that, that they um, you know, got what they were supposed to get, because some of them would just forget. She knew who they were. She wouldn't just let it go. She would say, well, I'll call them up and find out maybe they forgot to call. I know that for a fact because she used to tell me. <laughs> so she's a very, very, uh, now she works a lot at the um, St. Anthony Shrine in Boston. She goes there three days a week. She works at the food center and she, um, of course, goes to mass and she does activities on Sunday too. And then on Tuesday she goes again and she count, helps them count the money. So she does a lot of work there for the St. Anthony Shrine in Boston. She's a very compassionate woman. Absolutely. Very compassionate. Lois, maybe someday, and I hope it's real soon, who's who looks into you to get the Woman of the Year Award. Olivia, you also get Meals on Wheels, which you mentioned to me. Yes. Explain how senior citizens, and when you say senior citizens, what age are you talking about? Because there's different ages for senior I'm, citizens. I'm not sure. I think it's usually I, 60 years old. I over. think it might be 60. It used to be 65, but I know people that have gotten it when they were over 60, but they weren't 65 yet. There's a, there's a couple, I'll tell you how. Who do they contact? That's a good question. Uh, okay, I'll you. tell them how I got it, because... Um, well, actually, I asked Lois who to call because I had gotten her to get it when she, when she retired and she, her health was bad with her arthritis and everything. 
So the funny thing was I had, she knew who to call because that was her job. So uh, in 2016, in, in September of 2016, I got vertigo. Never had it before in my life. And it has nothing to do that I'm a senior. It just happened I was a senior. You can get it at any age. Mm. And so vertigo, the symptoms are dizziness and nausea, just like being seasick. The medicine I take for it is seasick medicine. There's nothing they can really do. It's, it's your ears. So when I came out of the hospital, I, I had it so bad, I was in the hospital for four days. So when I came home, I said to myself, well, how am I going to go to the grocery store? I can't even walk right now. So I said to myself, well, I'll call Meals on Wheels. And the weird thing was that the nurse called me early in the morning, on Monday morning, and wanted to know how I was. She found out that I was in the hospital, so I told her. And I said, I, I th think I'd like to call Meals on Wheels. So she said, well, go ahead. So I called them, and I told my situation that I had the vertigo. I just got it, and I was a senior. And um, could I get Meals on Wheels? I didn't know if I could. Because I thought you had to, you know, there were other, you know, other things. But she said, well, I'll check with your clinic and check with your doctor, and then we'll let you know. That was a Monday. The next day she called me, and she said, you'll start getting the Meals on Wheels on Wednesday. <laughs> so talk about fast service, right? That was fast. That was fast. And um, meals on, you can get Meals on Wheels a couple of ways. One is, in my case, it was because of the vertigo had nothing to do with finances or I wasn't getting any help from elder services of any kind or anything. Then you can get it because you're, you had an operation and you're sort of incapacitated, but you have to be a senior citizen. And sometimes people get it because they don't have a lot of money. My case, money had nothing to do with it. And I wasn't getting, it, it's Mystic Valley Elder Services, but I wasn't getting anything from them Excuse whatsoever. Me. Excuse me, that's who you contact, Mystic Valley yeah, Elder Services? Yeah, Mystic Service? Valley, it's, it's in Malden. Okay. So but the senior center would know, you, if you call the senior center, they, I'm sure they could tell you. Oh, yeah. Oh, they can look up the phone number for Mystic Valley Elder Services yeah. or email them even. And, and the, the funniest thing is the gentleman that comes and brings the food is a friend of mine <laughs> from my church. He only lives on Pleasant Street. <laughs> Whoever dreamed it was going to be somebody I knew, which makes it nice. Right, small world. Yeah, so that, that's, um, that's, that's how, the, uh, you don't have to pay a penny. You voluntarily, they send you a letter every month with the amount, if you want to pay. I do, because I'm so grateful to get it. It's only $2 a meal, so it's five days a week, so I mean, that's not very much. So it's like $40 a month. Yeah. Approximately, yeah. d depending on holidays. Or right. I mean, but other people, you don't have to. They say this is completely voluntary. They just send the letter to everybody. So there's no obligation or anything because some people can't afford also, it. So uh, let me get this straight. So you don't pay the $2 right away. They bill you at the end they of the month? They bill at the end of the month, and I just send them a check. It's not. In the old days when my mother got it, you had to pay every week. Oh, I see. You'd give the man the money like on Monday, you'd give him the cash, but they don't do that anymore. They, they send you an envelope and, and the letter, and then you just put the letter in the envelope and you put the check and then you send it back. And that's Mystic Valley and Malden. Right. What's the name, Mystic Valley? Mystic Valley Elder oh, Services, I believe is the name. Right, and that's great. We got about three minutes left, so I want you to three and a half minutes. Well, you, and your, for your future plans, excuse me, your future of what you would like to see for people helping blind people or blind people, well, helping the blind people, what would you like to see in the future? Well, I, uh, because I have the vertigo, I'm, I'm more limited than I used to be, but I still do, I intend to still continue doing the knitting. I do it for the veterans at the soldier's home and the animals, the cats and dogs, and the babies. I make baby bonnets and um, little uh, blankets for the babies. But I make the lap robes and the scarves for the people at the soldier's home. And I make the um, blankets for the cats and dogs. So that's my main charity right now. <laughs> right. And Lois used to do a uh, knitting for the seniors at the senior center. Right, that's why I get the yarn. 
And you know, folks, a lot of you who are seniors should come down to our senior center. We have meals too, not meals on wheels, but call a day in advance and come down and join us for lunch at 25 Winthrop Avenue. You'd love it. We've got great people working there, great director, Mr. Fielding. We've got great, great, great things for seniors there, exercises and everything. So we'd like to see them come down too. So, Olivia, do you have any um, t uh, family members that you would like to say thank you, like veterans that you have? Because I also like a veteran myself, and I want to thank all the veterans out there, especially the senior veterans. Well, I had a lot of veterans in my family, but they're all, they've all passed away. My brother, my brother-in-law, a lot of my uncles, they were all veterans, either World War II or Korea. And I, I, I am so grateful to all the veterans. And, and, and my brother was a fireman, so I'm always grateful to the firemen and the police, the first responders. When I got the vertigo, I called 911, and they were there in no time, the two very nice men to help me to get me to the ambulance to go to well, the hospital. Well, I have to tell you, we have one of the best fire departments in the country that I've been Absolutely. I believe you. And one of the best police departments. Now I want to Chief Jimmy Guido, who's our new chief. Happy New Year, Jimmy. And uh, we have the best of the best, I think, right here in Revere. I think so, too. Now, I'd like to close the show, if I may, Olivia, to tell you it was an honor and a pleasure to have you come here. Just reach out your hand so I can shake it. There Thank you, you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let Thank me wish you, you a happy, me. healthy New Year. Thank you. Right here, if they can just zero in on the award of Who's Who 2017 so they can show that on the plaque. Then you have one in the center there also, if they can zero in on that one there on the plaque. And, of course, one more time on the great picture there on your left. And it's a nice picture. So, again, Olivia, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much. And to all the people in Revere, thank you for listening. And to all the servicemen, God bless you. God bless the great country, the United States of America. And thank you for watching. Till next time. <laughs>